Hey everybody, it's Nicholas Rogers with the Big Timber Lodge <laughs> YouTube channel and I just want to be honest with you. It seems like lately when I get onto YouTube and I look up firearms or firearms accessories, instead of getting an honest opinion or an honest review, it feels like the people I'm watching were given the gear and told, hey, give us a positive, you know, spin on our stuff so that we could sell it and it's kind of true other youtubers now are starting to talk about it one of my favorite youtubers cyclops joe just made a video about vortex scopes and he had these two clips to say <laughs> <laughs> um but I wanted to talk to you about my Blackout Defense rifle. Now, I am an affiliate of Blackout Defense. This is my rifle that is in front of me. An affiliate means if you guys purchase one of their firearms through the links in my video description, I make money. Now, Blackout Defense was the very first company that I became an affiliate for, and that was after I purchased my own rifle. I bought this. They did not give this to me like a lot of other YouTube videos that you're seeing where people are reviewing gear. It's because they get free gear and then they do a review. And typically if you get free gear, you're going to talk really highly about it. But I just wanted to talk to you today about, honestly, I bought this rifle myself and everything else that you see on the table in front of me, including the ammunition, the magazine, the scope, this Night Force Attacker 1-8, to and then also the Badger Ordnance Scope Mount and then my Dead Air Sierra 5 can. This is my own personal rifle. This is not something that I just put on YouTube because I'm trying to sell things. This is my shit hits the fan rifle. I know this video is probably not gonna get monetized, so I'm just gonna talk to you straight how I would normally talk to a friend about gear if they actually came to me and said, hey, what do you honestly think about X? X being this rifle and this setup. So I want to do some upgrades to this rifle. It is fantastic. From out of box, it was fantastic. It shot really well. Now they claim sub MOA groups, and I have gotten sub MOA groups. With this particular rifle, I have gotten 0.7 MOA groups, and I have that on video. Now, to be honest and fair, that was on one of my best days shooting, and I was using the best ammunition that I could find for this rifle. Now with standard, let's say Fiocchi range dynamics, you know, hollow point boat tail or whatever the hell this is. I think this is full metal jacket boat tail ammo. I'm probably going to get around one to one and a half MOA groups. And that's on a good day for me, right? Now there are ammo manufacturers out there that make more expensive, like 77 grain um, hollow point boat tails, such as Mead Industries or Black Hills or other companies as well, that you will get right around that one MOA or sub one MOA groupings, but it's gonna be more expensive to shoot. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm like, oh, this rifle sucks because I can't always get sub MOA groups with any ammunition. All of my firearms are ammo particular, meaning they all have their favorites and their least favorite ammunition manufacturers and the size of the bullets, whether it's a 55 grain, 62 grain, 69 grain, 77 grain. And even with my competition AR rifle that I shot a sub half MOA group, five shot group on camera, that rifle is very particular about the type of ammo that it likes to shoot because even with cheap 55 grain stuff, I will get like two and a half to three MOA groups. It's crazy. I don't understand it. There are scientists, there are engineers that understand why that happens. Uh, it has to do with like the, the actual diameter of the bullet that's traveling down the, 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 the barrel, the chambering on, on the barrel, the, the amount of powder that they put in there. There's a lot of science that actually goes into what makes your rifle going to be accurate with that ammunition. It's one of the reasons why people get into reloading. So I just wanted to be honest with you. This rifle is around a one MOA grouping rifle, and that's with the 13.9 inch barrel configuration. I'm sure if I would have gone with a longer barrel configuration, it probably would be more accurate and more likely to shoot sub MOA groups all of the time. But for what I wanted to have this for, I didn't need to have MOA or sub MOA grouping. I'm happy that this is an MOA rifle and I can shoot sub MOA groups with it, but I want to have this in a time of need where I know that it's reliability 
is going to be 100%. I want to know that whatever ammunition that I'm carrying in my shit hits the fan magazines with this rifle is going to shoot every time I pull the trigger and it's not going to cause a malfunction. And I will say with this rifle, I have had zero malfunctions with all of the ammunition that I have fired through it. Absolutely love that about this rifle. Now, Another thing is, because this is my shit hits the fan rifle, my adrenaline is probably going to be going. My heart is going to be pumping if I ever actually had to deploy this in a situation in which I actually purchased it for. And I want to be able to know that it is accurate enough. It's not a bench rest rifle. And I, I don't know how I can just reiterate that enough to my viewers. This is not a bench rest competition rifle. It is meant to be carried on a sling, which I purchased myself. This is a Magpul two-point sling, and I absolutely love this sling. I have practiced with it, and when I'm running around and getting my heart rate up, and I don't show this stuff because, let's be honest, I'm a bigger guy, and I'm not tactical or tactical. I'm more like a tactical dude, but I don't even want to pretend like I'm tactical. I don't want to try to let people you know, think that I'm trying to coach you on how to be tactical with your firearms or see me running around as a bigger dude. And then I get a lot of hateful comments saying, oh, you're fat, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know I'm a bigger dude. I do exercise. I'm in good enough shape that I could take care of my family if the shit hits the fan. And I am good enough shape that I can practice with this firearm. That's another big thing. Make sure you're practicing with your firearms in the condition in which you would have to deploy them. All right. If you buy a shit hits the fan rifle, don't just take it to the shooting range and sit at a bench and shoot it off the bench and think you're good to go. Practice, you know, doing mag reloads, you know, practice dumping a mag in the middle of, uh, you know, out of, out of the, the, the mag, uh, mag well during halfway through a, you know, a firing situation to simulate a malfunction and then work your way through a malfunction. If you have somebody else there, they can cause a malfunction by pushing like a stick into the chambering so that the bolt can't close all the way and then you have to, to, to work through your malfunction. That's a great way to practice, okay? Because if you're buying this for a shits hits the fan situation, chances are your heart's gonna be going, your adrenaline's gonna be going, you're gonna be out of breath and you need to practice in that type of environment. And so back to the original thing, this rifle is fantastic out of box, but it does need some upgrades for what I wanna see this do for me. So this is my Dead Air Sierra 5 suppressor it has the chemo mount the chemo adapter on the end of the barrel came from blackout defense it's pin and welded onto the end of the barrel that's why i can get this without having to get an sbr tack stamp is because even though the barrel is 13.9 inches this adds enough length onto the end of barrel that is now over or right at that 16 inch mark so it's not considered an sbr now that doesn't really affect me because i when i put this onto the end of the rifle I'm, I'm, it's, it's going to go all the way down to where the chemo mod meets the end of the barrel. And so it's acting like it is a 13.9 inch barrel because we're having this much of the actual chemo adapter sticking into the internals of my actual suppressor. Now, one of the things that it did do was because this is a hybrid muzzle brake and flash hider is by putting the suppressor on here, I actually started to notice I got a little bit more felt recoil and a little bit more muzzle flip because this is a short barreled rifle. Um, and so I wanna try to eliminate some of that felt recoil by rocking it with the suppressor and also help alleviate some of the muzzle flip. So what can I do about that? Well, another thing that went with adding the suppressor on here is I'm getting over gassing in my face. It's not horrible, but over gassing means when the suppressor is on the end of the barrel, now I'm getting more back pressure going through my gas block up into the impingement system, back into where the BCG is, the bolt carrier group, and there's more gases coming back towards me, and I'm getting gases that are leaking out in the seams of the upper and lower receiver, as well as I'm noticing that there's a lot more carbon on my spent shell casings coming out. So it's overgassed, and that's affecting the timing. What I did do is I put a heavier buffer weight into my buffer system. I have an Odinworks heavyweight buffer tube or buffer system. And that helped eliminate some of the felt recoil. It actually helped with the ejection pattern when the su suppressor was on the rifle because as the rifle was ejecting the spent casings, they were actually bouncing off my Trigicon RMR, which I have up here. So by putting a heavier weight buffer, an H3 weight buffer in there, that slowed down the speed at which the buffer would travel backwards against the uh, buffer spring inside of the buffer tube. And that actually helped with the timing and the ejection pattern, but it's still not good enough. So 
what am I going to be doing with this? Well, I'm going to be putting in a JP silent capture spring system, which I already have on my um, competition AR-15 that's in a Loki uh, weapon system, 18-inch barrel, and I absolutely love it absolutely love it and it is it is fully adjustable too uh it's going to come to me with an h2 configuration as far as the buffer weight goes and they're sending me uh i purchased an additional because i bought all of this this is my own personal stuff i don't get any of this stuff for free i purchased an additional tungsten weight that i can put onto the jp silent capture spring to actually take it from an h2 weight to an h3 to increase the weight to actually help slow that recoil impulse as as the buffer comes backwards into the buffer system now on top of that, I'm going to be sending this rifle back to Blackout Defense to the owner, and he is going to be swapping out. I have a traditional low pro gas block on this barrel, and he's going to be putting a super superlative arms adjustable gas block that will either be able to deny gases or be able to like build gases. I don't, I don't know the exact correct terminology for it, but think of like a blow off valve for a turbocharge. If there's too many uh, too much gas is going towards the, the turbo. It can actually send those gases through the wastegate. And that's where you hear like a psh, psh, psh noise on a turbocharged vehicle. And that'll be kind of what that superlative arms could do, but it's going to be redirecting the extra gases. It's going to essentially allow enough gases to travel backwards, to be able to move the bulk carrier group assembly rearward with and cycle correctly without having uh timing issues or having the ejection pattern too far forward it's going to be able to allow me to really dial it in but then any of the extra gases it's going to be shooting it out the front of the actual gas block kind of like a wastegate on a turbocharger and that's going to help alleviate some of the extra gases that are getting captured inside of my suppressor as well as not and also alleviate some of the extra gases that are, are trying to travel back down the impingement system to the bolt carrier group to cycle the round so i'm going to be doing that i'm going to be doing the jp uh, enterprise silent capture spring as well as the superlative arms adjustable gas block and that should really help me dial in the felt recoil as well as the timing and the ejection patterns and not having this over gassed okay so i should see a lot less carbon on the rounds when they come out of the ejection port as well as i'm not going to have nearly as much gas going back into my face now if both of those work together i won't need to do a gas blocking charging handle or like a radian gas dispersion charging handle those two together should mitigate the gases enough that i should be able to use this striker blackout defense charging handle if there still is a little bit extra gas that's coming into my face i'm going to look at some sort of charging handle that does have like a gas blocking or a gas dispersion system to help mitigate it from coming back into my 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 mouth and my face um now, what next am I going to do to this rifle? Well, absolutely love the hybrid trigger from Blackout Defense, but this is the four and a half pound trigger, and I want to try the three pound trigger. I want this rifle to be faster for me. The four and a half pound is great for combat and shit hits the fan situation, especially for people that aren't used to shooting a lot. But for me, four and a half pound trigger weight on a rifle is heavy, and even when I'm doing my drills, um, I want it lighter. So I'm going to try the three pound trigger weight, uh, the three pound hybrid trigger, or I might just go to a flat trigger. It's going to depend. I won't go to the standard curved trigger. It's going to either be the hybrid, which is kind of in the between a curved and a flat. And therefore it's kind of like this, or I just might go to the straight vertical trigger. So that way, if I really want to go fast, I could put the tip of my finger down at the very base of the trigger, and then I'll have more leverage which will allow me to not have to use as much force in order to get the trigger to actually work. Uh, it, the flat face trigger actually opens up a, a variety of accuracy versus also trigger pull weight that you feel based off of physics and geometry and the leverage that's going into the actual trigger. Don't need to get into that now. Um, what about the angled foregrip? So I would have preferred just a little stub and I've thought about going to the little stub just because I actually like that preferred when I'm actually shooting the rifle in a traditional manner looking through the optic but I went with the angled foregrip like this because of the fact that all right empty empty when I'm in this position if I'm looking through my scope and I all of a sudden want to rotate over to my red dot system this grip that I have on the front of the the handguard with this angled foregrip 
is a lot easier to just rotate into this position versus if I actually had a nub here on the bottom of the handguard and then wanted to rotate really quickly, that's an uncomfortable position for me. I would have to be on the nub and then release my thumb and allow the handguard to rotate over. Whereas with this angled foregrip, I like the way that this feels for a quick rotation from looking through the LPVO over to the red dot site because I don't have to transition anything with my hand. My hand could just stay exactly where it's at and I get articulation through the wrist. Now, I also purchased a suppressor cover for this Sierra 5. Um, that's another big thing to talk about as well is the Dead Air Sierra 5. I haven't had any issues with the suppressor as far as like failures or catastrophic failures or exploding or baffle strikes. I did have issues when I first took it to the range because there was no thread locker on either the end cap, which is just a flash hider that comes from Sierra 5 or the suppressor body going onto the chemo mod, the hub. And I had a little bit of issues with the suppressor actually starting to unscrew itself from the actual hub as well as the flash hider end cap started to unscrew itself from the end of the suppressor. And now, since I've put Threadlocker on there, there hasn't been an issue. But you're probably all fully aware now of the issues that the Dead Air Sierra 5 are happening are having because of the outsourcing of the production of this suppressor to a third-party company and it not being quality control checked the way that it should have been. And now people are very upset because their brand new suppressors are blowing up after 100, 200, or 1,000 rounds. And then they're sending it back to dead air and they're, and they're having to wait months or I don't know, indefinitely now for it to be repaired. Um, thankfully for me, I haven't had that and I pray that it doesn't happen, but I do feel bad for those of you that did purchase one of the Sierra fives and it did happen to you. Um, so I would say if I had it to do over again, because I am using this as a dedicated 5.56 rifle, I probably wouldn't have purchased the Dead Air Sierra 5. I love the way that it works on this rifle as far as quieting the noise. It is extremely good at quieting the noise on this rifle. But with all of the negative things that we're hearing about the Sierra 5 from Dead Air, I probably would have purchased a different suppressor. And honestly, I probably would have purchased a flow through suppressor instead of a traditional baffled suppressor because this is 556 and it's shooting relatively quick rounds like these are 62 grain full metal jacket boat tails firing at 3000 feet per second and you're not going to be shooting this through or shooting 556 with like subsonic rounds if you want to shoot subsonic 556 rounds you just need to get a 300 blackout, which is a 5.56 casing necked open to a 30 caliber with much heavier rounds that are flying subsonic, but 5.56 is not. Now, because this has so much velocity, it's creating a lot of gas, and that's where I'm getting all this back pressure, and I'm getting over gassing, I'm getting gases in my face, it's affecting the timing, the ejection pattern, but with a flow-through suppressor, I would have gotten near to the sound suppressioning as this but it would have allowed the gases to travel downwards be caught and then travel backwards and then forwards and it's all going in like a turbine engine movement so it, what it's doing is it's elongating the path that the gases travel greatly by different you know tubings that in, or, or patterns inside of the suppressor and then it allows all the gases to flow out the front of the actual suppressor after the round has flown out and it silences or helps quiet, and quiet down the exploding gases coming out the end of the barrel. Doesn't work as well as a baffled suppressor, but if you're shooting supersonic ammunition, the rifle's never going to be super quiet anyways because the bullet is still going to be breaking the speed of sound or the sound barrier and making that supersonic cracking noise. So is it really distinguishable to ear? Maybe a little bit, but not by much. But what it would do with a flow through suppressor is it allows all those extra gases just to travel out the end of the suppressor after they've gone through all those movements. And it cuts down on the back pressure greatly. I believe Huxworks has one. It's called like the Flow 556. 
and it only increases back pressure by like 5%. Whereas this is like a massive increase in back pressure with the traditional baffled uh, suppressor. Now, I'm not going to swap out the Sierra 5. That is not something because this was an expensive addition to this rifle. And also, I had to wait over a year for my NFA tax stamp. So I'm just going to ride this out, pray that nothing goes wrong, and try to address the back pressure issues with the adjustable gas block from superlative arms, as well as the JP Enterprise silent capture spring. And then hopefully I don't need to get some sort of like Geisley, you know, gas blocking charging handle or Radiant Arms gas dispersion charging handle and that everything that I'm doing to this rifle will fix that because I want to have this rifle shoot as soft accurately and reliable as possible so that if i was in a shit hits the fan situation i will be able to keep my optic or my red dot on target as easy as possible without having to really worry about muscling it onto the target and i just want that to to be what this rifle is built for once again this is my own personal rifle absolutely love it um, and there's one other thing that i'm going to be doing with this rifle for sure i've already ordered it is the law tactical folder for the the gen 3 m folder for where the buffer uh buffer tube meets the end of the receiver right where the castle nut is uh, of the upper receiver and what that will allow me to do is take the butt stock and then fold it against the non-ejection port side so it'll fold over here and then without having the actual suppressor on the rifle the rifle will now only be this long and then it can become a truck gun or like a backpack gun for a shit hits the fan situation where let's say you need to move through a crowded environment, but last thing that you want to do is alarm people that you have a firearm. Um, and therefore, if you would, if you could put it into like a backpack and carry it through a crowded environment without alerting people, and and then that's the last thing that i'm going to be doing with this rifle so now just to be aware if you're thinking about doing that there is and you want to use the jp enterprise silent capture spring they make a very specific capture spring for the law tactical folder all right don't go buying a jp silent capture spring for a carbine length you know buffer tube and then think it's going to work with the law tactical folder i don't want to get into the details of it but i will just let you know if you use the law tactical folder on a modern sporting rifle like this and you want to use the jp silent capture spring you have to use the jp silent capture spring that was made specifically for the law tactical folder now i'm purchasing all of this myself i haven't gotten any sort of discounts on any of the gear that i'm talking about this is just nicholas rogers purchasing the rifle that he wants to have in case the shit hits the fan and this is not sponsored by anybody um and i just want to keep pointing that out i am not coming to you as an affiliate of anybody i already purchased this rifle from blackout defense yes i do make money if you click on the link in the video description and you purchase one but i purchased this with my hard-earned cash and that is one of the reasons why i'm an affiliate is because i actually believe in this rifle and I think it is fantastic. This is one of the guns that I would grab if all of a sudden the world started to end today. Okay. Now, additionally, too, I also have, just so you guys know, I have some Fioki Range Dynamics 62 grain, like I said, full metal jacket, boat tele ammunition in front of me, because that's what I'm going to take to the range and practice with. Purchase that myself. And then I shoot ADI, what I have in my, you know, magazines that are sitting in my safe for in case the shit hits the fan is some adi ss 109 62 grain penetrator core from australian defense industries i can't shoot that at the shooting range i'm not supposed to because it's penetrator core right and i go to an indoor range um and they shoot fairly close to each other all right as far as the accuracy goes so that's that's a good thing that's one of the things that i do as well but yeah so that's that's everything that you see in front of me uh i guess i could talk about the night force attacker one to eight a little bit i've never really done a review on the scope nor have i done one on the trigicon rmr the attacker it's a tank okay this the the feeling of this scope especially paired with the Badger Ordnance Condition 1 scope rings is this isn't going where I could throw this on the ground, you could run it over with a car and it's still going to function. 
it's amazing how bulky and and just heavy duty it feels it's extremely heavy duty feeling like it's legitimately a good tactical scope is it the best glass that i've ever seen no uh another thing is too is the fixed parallax i wish that it had an adjustable parallax on the side uh my eyes aren't bad i still have close to like 20 20 vision but even when i'm at the range shooting this at like 100 yards um it's difficult to get my crosshair to be in focus with the target being in focus because i believe the fixed parallax starts at 150 yards and goes out to infinity so i'm technically like 33 percent too close in order for the adjust or the fixed parallax to actually be working and so um if you're targeting you know getting the sighted in at 100 yards it's going to seem a little blurry it's difficult to actually for me personally to get my crosshair to focus while focus on the target as well if that makes sense the illumination in this is okay too i mean it does its job right it does its job i really don't ever shoot it with illumination unless i'm outdoors shooting towards dusk or dawn um, but there can be a little bleed over from the light inside of the reticle and kind of just you know star lighting out through the scope but it's not bad it's not a bad thing the trujicon rmr absolutely love this i have this sighted in at 25 yards i have the scope sighted in at 100 and then you know it's an easy transition as i showed you to go from looking down the scope to over to this and then now i'm looking through this this trijicon rmr is built like a tank itself it has shake awake technology so it just always stays on and i forget how many tens of thousands of hours of battery life it has but it's a ridiculous amount um and it's not a big issue it's it's waterproof everything on this is just built like a freaking tank so that is my honest rundown of this rifle and i just wanted to like start a a video with you guys to let you know that i still love making honest content for my viewers and i'm going to keep making honest content for you yes am i going to do sponsored stuff or not sponsored but where people give me gear to review absolutely because that's kind of what helps me keep the channel alive um, but I will also keep making content about stuff that I'm just spending my cold, hard earned cash on because it's what I want. And I, and I want to let you guys know, honestly, Hey, is this a good investment, right? Is this worth the money? Because if I make that purchase and I don't like it, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, that might tell you, Hey, maybe I shouldn't make that purchase either. And then you can look at something else. So, or maybe you can make a recommendation to me. So leave a comment below. Hey, I don't like what you're doing with this. This is my experience that I've had. Maybe you should take a look at something else. And I love reading the comments and interacting with my viewers. So make sure to also subscribe and turn on notifications, all notifications, because as I get this gear, and this is not going to be happening relatively quick. This is going to be happening over December, January, February, like a three month process, because I don't have a lot of extra money just to spend on my own personal gear if I'm not doing reviews that are people giving me stuff. And so I, I'm going to have to purchase all this and it's not going to be relatively cheap. So I'm going to be spacing this out over the next several months so that I can do it piece by piece and then, you know, put everything together and then come back and, and do reviews as it progresses and then come back to you guys and give you a full final review on what I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was a little long-winded. It's just one giant cut, but yeah, you know, I'll talk to you later. Peace.